I think for a second, I thought that there was no value to my television world in the academic world mm -hmm. um, because I'd kind of been told every which way, like keep that elsewhere, just be a student in this classroom. And I'm like, Melanin Goddess, that's before me, hello. On this episode of Another Act, I finally sit down with Yara Shahidi and we talk about saying goodbye to Blackish, why Gronish just feels so real, and how her own collegiate experience is going to show up in the work she does as an actor, producer, and an activist moving forward. Hi, Yara, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well. You know, every time I think that Gronish can't get any bolder, it does. I want to <laughs> yeah. go back to, you know, when this spinoff was in the creation phase, because what I'm imagining is that you were a very loud voice in the room, kind of talking mm -hmm. about what the tone of this series mm -hmm. might be, and that's how we got here. Can you tell me a little bit about what that process was like at the beginning all those years ago? Yeah, of course. Well, it was super unexpected. In all honesty, I thought my character was going to fade into oblivion and come back to do her laundry. And that was about the extent of it when they sent her off to college, because so much of Zoe's college storyline on Blackish wasn't set with me knowing that there was a spinoff in mind until much later on. And I was actually going through my own college application process. And it was the day after I sent in all my applications that my mother turns to me and goes, Kenya called. He has an idea for a spinoff. Which I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> uh -huh. And so what was interesting was I remember the first meeting with him and Larry Wilmore walking in and really not being sure what this was going to look like. And what they pitched and what was so interesting to me was basically saying like, Blackish has a tone and a way of telling stories that's super important and great. And our goal with this is not to recreate Blackish because that's doing something special, but to figure out what stories we can tell particularly when we're centering a young woman of color and expanding that world. Like what stories are we not able to tell on Blackish just because of whose perspective it's from that we can then lean into Gronish to tell. And that was such an exciting opportunity. And I have to say, like I wasn't necessarily all up in the writer's room, but some of the incredible opportunities that were given to me was the fact that Kenya called me at 17 and was like, who's the first writer you want in the room? And so I was able to call a writer that I knew personally and at 17 be like, hey, so I have my own show. <laughs> I thought about you immediately. <laughs> Would you love to be on this show? And so, I mean, the writers didn't necessarily need directive because there was such a magic in really trusting that we could create something that was unorthodox in mm -hmm. having writers in that hadn't written for television before, that came from different experiences and coupled with people that like knew that this was their bread and butter and their passion. And when they all got together, I think they were able to be bold because it wasn't a room that was created by the literal linear orthodox structures of how you go through television in the world. So as the show's progressed, I think we've been able to lean even more deeply into our voice and use what's been established of these characters to expand what stories we tell because they feel earned. They don't feel like, oh, we're just grabbing for things. But this is naturally, once you've gotten to know all these characters for the past four years, what they'd be discussing. And I'm kind of in a weird spot with my boyfriend. I really didn't want to answer a ton of questions from my nosy roommates. Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. Some people can never just mind their own business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what is going on with you and that handsome boyfriend of yours? So that's really how we get at this authenticity that we ultimately have have been experiencing while we've been watching, you know, Zoe's journey. Yeah. And And I think that you know, there's so many things that I actually really love about this series. And, and one thing is really that it mirrors exactly kind of where you are in life. Too. Yeah. Let's talk about those similarities. What do you share with Zoe that you think gets shown and seen in this series? Mm -hmm. For the longest time, I would always say that Zoe was my polar opposite. I mean, even through Blackish, there were very few like overt similarities in terms of how we respond to situations. But through Gronish, like you're saying, there has been this kind of art imitating life in a way that I didn't even expect. You know, I started Gronish before I started college. So Gronish was my first touch point with what I could imagine college to be like. And it was interesting because when I got to school, I think it was season two and three when Zoe realizes she wants to be a stylist, where art start imitating life in different ways in terms of having to understand what that juggling act looks like. 
and the fact that all of your passions do come with sacrifices. There was one scene and it was super simple. It was when Nomi had her baby and the girls put together kind of um, like a nursery and Zoe wasn't there for that. And it may have been such a simple scene, but Anna's character pulls Zoe aside and shows her this kind of collage they made of the girls and says like, even if you're gone back and forth, like we're still here for you. And even though it's probably 30 seconds of this entire show, I started crying in rehearsal because at the time that was literally my life. I was on campus three days a week, got all my classes done. As soon as I was done with class, I had a suitcase with me. I'd go fly, I'd film Grownish, and then I'd come back on the weekends. And so I felt like I was missing so much of the in-between life, the stuff that you get to enjoy when you just get to, for example, sit on set because you're not writing an essay in your trailer. <laughs> and then similarly at school, just getting to sit at school and see what happens because you're around. And so there was something about those scenes and those scenes when we get to see Zoe juggle that I feel like it's really honest. The idea that you can love what you do. You can love both things that you do and still feel like there's a struggle there. You know, I really admire, um, and I know that you're not the first actor to have navigated working on a show and also college at the same time, but all the same, I really admire that you are doing both things at the same time. Why was that mm -hmm. so important for you? Well, honestly, I think it's because I always knew I wanted to go to school. Like, since I was four, I know my grandfather has letters where I was like, I need you to be my college roommate. Will you commit to that right now? <laughs> and so... That was like, I've always been a nerd. I think I've been privileged enough to have these school experiences that centered on what I wanted to learn. Even when I was distance learning, I've done Montessori, all girls Catholic school, public school, everything in between. And from that, I've always had a really positive relationship with education where it was literally a tool for me to dive into what interests me and figure out how it affects the world. And so knowing that, you know, even when I was filming Blackish, everyone knew that I was going to go to school and it was a conversation for so long. They were the ones helping me because I'd leave my AP test like uh, booklets everywhere on set and then they would have to be located. <laughs> um, and so when uh, I already knew I was going to take a gap year and that's when we filmed Grownish and that was because I just graduated at 17. And so that was already planned and, you know, shows they could, you, you shoot a pilot. I've done a show where we pulled up day seven and they're like, they didn't tell you the show's done. <laughs> like you just never know. And yeah. so it was really just, let's take this bet. Let's make a show that seems pretty exciting. But I had no clue, especially when I was then looking at starting school, that this was then going to become a cornerstone of a network and that they'd be like, all right, season two, let's do it. And so it really came down to coming to campus and realizing how special it was to be there at that time to realize that yes, I could postpone it and try and find a more convenient time, but there was something just really wonderful. And it came down to the black professors on campus and being like, there's a time where I can learn from them. And yes, they will be teaching for a long time, but there was something so special about landing on campus where I literally looked at mommy and she's like, you're not going anywhere, are you? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> I love that. And I also love that you are interested in, in being a professor yourself and studying mm -hmm. history. Tell me a little bit about that because obviously that feels like a departure from the world of, of acting yeah. and producing <laughs> and, and all the things that I know that you're also interested in doing. So where does that come from? Well, I wanted to be a historian by the time I was 10. I had like a, whatchamacallit, a birthday party where I had all my friends dress up as what they wanted to be growing up. And I had a seersucker suit on and a pocket watch because that's what I imagined <laughs> historians to be. Now I know I want to be in academia in the future. I'm trying to figure out what grad school looks like for me. But what's been really full circle is that I'm now at a point in my studies and in my career in which they're overlapping in ways that are so initially unexpected. Uh, at first, it does feel like there's like this divide between Hollywood and academia. But now, I mean, I spend most of my time studying what is radical representation. How do you undermine colonial storytelling? And even my thesis, it wasn't something that I walked in saying, okay, how do I combine television into this? But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going through the work of the scholar Sylvia Winter. And she started off as an entertainer, as a dancer, as a playwright, and, and made her switch into academia. And so much of what she's saying is like, let's value narrative as a tool to disrupt. And not just say it in a cool sense, like, oh, it's nice to see ourselves on screen, but to know that there's an actual potential there. 
when you look at narrative, not just on screen, but generally the culture it helps produce. And so I say all that to say, you know, at first there were much more serious conversations in my mind about like, how in the world am I going to pair this academic world that I love with my entertainment world? And it's come together so beautifully. And I have to thank my professor Cornell West for that because we had done a one-on-one -on -one class in which he literally took what he knew I was studying because my concentration is black political thought under neocolonialism and centered it in film critique. And for so long, even Harvard, like they don't care about this. They don't care that I have a press tour to do today <laughs> um, if you have something to do. And so I think for a second, I thought that there was no value to my television world in the academic world because I'd kind of been told every which way, like keep that elsewhere, just be a student in this classroom. And so to be at a point where I not only feel like my academics are informing what I create and the intentionality by which I create, but to know that having had real world experience and what it means to tell stories is also influencing what I can bring to academics has been a beautiful experience. I still don't know where I'm going with it, but I at least feel like there's a much more alignment now than when I started off. Well, no, for sure. I was going to say your voice, and I hope I hope that you know this, it is such a huge asset. You know, you, you've obviously used your platform for activism, and that's felt so important, especially because you really are quite literally the voice of a generation, you know, from opening doors and diversity within film and television mm -hmm. to advocating for women's rights, Black equity, mm -hmm. um, social justice, so on and so forth through the projects that you that you engage in and that you um, are activated by, where did you first get the courage to do this and speak out? Because, I mean, it, it, it is very courageous, I think, <laughs> uh, the things that you, that you find passionate about. Yeah. I mean, all credit goes to my family, in all honesty. I think my household is always centered around how do you give back? I think something that my parents have always said, and I grew up hearing, is that abundance has to flow. You are not supposed to be, when something comes your way, you are not supposed to be the end recipient. You are supposed to be the vehicle by which it flows to the next person. And I think that applies to so much of how we operate. Of course, there's like the monetary sense of, of donating or, or giving your time even. But I think in terms of even thinking about acting opportunities, it's like, well, how do I take the abundance that's coming my way in terms of the platform? The fact that people are giving me the space to speak and listening to then create impact. And that goes again, back to my family of saying, you know, none of the conversations that I've had publicly are new. It's just a reflection of what my parents had us talking about at a young age. My grandfather, my papa was extremely involved in the civil rights movement. And he's also an Aquarius. I, I, I am him. <laughs> so if you ever are curious about how I am the way I am, turn to him. What does racism take from us? A pursuit. Of happiness. But what it can't take is William E. Du Bois said, it cannot take our laughter, mm -hmm. our defiant laughter. And similarly, my grandpa on the other side of my family is the reason I love history and the fact that I think I grew up really grounded in knowing how much had been given up for me to experience the life that I do from generations, both literally within my familial heritage, but also culturally within people that that committed to servicing a world that they knew that they may not even see. Saying like, I'm, I'm gonna put my life on the line for this. And there's so many incredible creatives that have modeled that. I mean, even, you know, as we think about the incredible Sidney Poitier passing, he, he was somebody who unabashedly put his career and life on the line when the stakes were much higher than they are for me now. Now, at least some of a, a subculture in which you're being applauded for having a voice that did not exist. Uh, even a generation prior. And so honestly, I think it comes, my, my speaking up mostly comes from just a deep space of gratitude of knowing that it had to be done for me to do it and feeling like in order to make all of these things matter, you know, red carpets don't matter. <laughs> they're, they're, like it's such an arbitrary concept and I love it. So in order to make these spaces that I have the privilege of going in and having a lot of fun matter, it's like, well, it has to be grounded in something with the goal of moving towards a, another goal greater than. No, I love everything that you said. I feel like I am listening uh, to you talk in a lecture hall and this is so <laughs> awesome. I could do this all day. You know, you have been vocal about the significance of purpose, impact, and intentionality in everything that you do. Tell me about this, this season of, of Grownish. you know, what mm -hmm. would you, how would you describe the purpose of this season? Yeah, well, 
I think the season prior with Zoe dropping out was a great moment because as much as this is a show that centers on college, that was a season where we departed from just the college environment to validate the fact that everyone's journey is different. And it may not touch college at all, but still you're just in the process of growing up. And so now I think with this part of the season and with graduation so close, the cool conversations that we get to have are about what it means to be transitioning into the real world. What are things that college in some way kind of suspends you from adult life? And so as they're prepping to go into a, a life where you don't get summer breaks and you don't get grades saying, hey, you're doing a good job, keep up the work, and you don't get the same support, but you have to find that for yourself. Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean? And so, you know, before the break in the season, we got to see moments like Zoe standing up to her boss and figuring out, is that the right thing to do? Because I value the fact that she is a disruptor for women of color and fashion. But I also have to value the fact that uh, I've been taken advantage of um, in this situation. And so watching her navigate situations that are so gray, so not clear, I feel like it's the best preparation for the real world that you can get. And this season in particular, I feel like it's such an interesting extension of trying to figure out what do the relationships that she's established in college mean as she plans for the real world? And how do you, does she, for once, really center herself in what she wants rather than feeling swayed by what everyone around her is saying? You know, obviously, Blackish also is coming to an end. Um, mm -hmm. How are you reflecting on a show, cast and crew? that has literally seen you grow up, you know, from 14 years old to the adult that you are now? I mean, I auditioned at 13 and like so many of the folks I've known for such a long time. It's surreal to watch it come to an end. But at the same time, you know, as we were filming the last episode, <laughs> one thing that came into mind that may sound weird, but was comforting is like so many people get kicked off television. It's beautiful to be in a space where people want more and that we get to end our story in a way that feels really good to us. This isn't us being like, oh, you're done with us. All right, let's wrap it up. It, but really with agency saying, we've told so many stories through the Johnson family. So now let's give them the send off that they deserve. That has definitely been, I, I think, comforting <laughs> in this time. And then also just, I think what made me really emotional, especially in the last day of filming was the fact that our crew has literally seen me grow up and you know so many of the people that came from Blackish would then go right over to Grownish to come support me and to work on Grownish so I got to see those familiar faces and they literally came because they knew how important it was for me to see them and to have a family on set and so to know that we're one of the few shows where people come back season after season you know one of the heads of our departments was like I'm retiring after Blackish because nothing can beat this and it's so great to end on this type of moment. And so to know that the impact that Black She's Made has not only happened on screen, but to everyone who's had the privilege of being a part of that show was really exciting. That's awesome. Before I let you go, congratulations, yeah. belated congratulations on Smokeland. What types of products oh. are you looking to do with your production company? I mean, what aren't we doing is the question. <laughs> I think what's funny is that Everyone says they have a dark sense of humor and then you wonder like, is it truly dark? So when I say, when I'm about to say, ah, I have a darker sense of humor, uh, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> but I, I, the reason I was saying that is, you know, when both mommy and I as partners were like, okay, we're moving to the production space, what television do we want to see? One, it was really fun to be able to create projects that honor the range of our personal humor. That may surprise people that have seen me only through the lens of, of Blackish and Grownish. So to honor those creative instincts has definitely been a treat. But we are doing everything from four quadrant animation because we love the animation space. Animation is how I first fell in love with what stories could do to creating shows like Smokeland to things that are really centered around drama and bringing us as, as brown and black folks centered into stories that we don't see ourselves in. You know, our only really anchoring fact is the fact that we know people do historical drama and trauma really well. And we're just not experts in that. So we, we center in stories that aren't anchored around our trauma without, without erasing the nuance and complications of our everyday lives. We love to just expand what you see of us. And so Smokeland, I feel like, is such a great example of that. And some of the other shows that we have coming down the pipeline that 
I wish we could talk about publicly, I think all hit on the same kind of sentiment of where you get to see us in the spaces of the absurd, in the spaces of science fiction, you know, really in the realms of our imagination. Amazing. I love all of that. Continued success as you embark on this next chapter. I really look forward to seeing all the things that you're going to do. Thank you.